Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 9, Episode 60. That's Dave Bryan. I am Alex Gazor of SteelersDepot.com. Happy Wednesday, Steelers Nation. Dave, Chris Boswell, still the Steelers kicker. Are you surprised? Uh, you know, look, I, like I said, I think I thought this could go either way. Uh, we'll see. I mean, Mike Tomlin, I think he, uh, I, I kind of, I was thinking about this, had to ret- uh, actually leave the house yesterday and return some, some medical equipment. I was trying to go over in my head uh, how Mike Tomlin has handled the kicker and all like that. And I thought, man, you you go from warning the kid that he's going to go to timeout, uh, huh. warning him again he's going to go to timeout, you put him into a, put him into timeout, uh, you keep shaking your finger at him, you're warning you're going to take his video games away, put him on weak restriction and all like that. I mean, there, there's a lot of warnings going on. And look, I understand they signed this guy to, uh, to a big contract, but let's, you know, let's face it. Uh, it's not it's not detrimental it's not going to kill the salary cap in 2019 uh if they cut him in in all actuality even though he's you know he's a 4.8 in dead money you know he was scheduled to count 4.2 against the cap in or is scheduled to count 4.2 against the cap in 2019 anyway so technically if you want to get technical about it they only they only lose about you know six hundred thousand uh, dollars in money if they have to cut him. No, obviously that's not going to prevent them from making the move here. Uh, what's going to you know prevent them from making the move is Boswell and Mike Tomlin. Mm-hmm. I thought he was very open. Uh, with what was going to go on, you know, that, that, that kickers are going to be brought in. I'm surprised they weren't brought in yesterday. Maybe they were, and they just weren't reported make, to make it by cutoff time. I don't know. We're, we'll find out more, obviously, by the end of today. But the fact that Chris Boswell made it through Tuesday, I think, has to be a good sign. But Tomlin did admit that part of the competition, that, that, that Boswell would be included in that. Yeah, I, I think it's been a weird situation. And before I get into, into my thoughts on Boswell, uh, we got two really good interviews today for you guys. Uh, first will be Melody Friedlander, Dr. Mel, talking about the injury situation. Uh, it's always good news and bad news when she's on. The good news because she offers tremendous insight, uh, a surgeon herself, but it's bad news because that usually means someone's hurt. And so talking a lot about Ben, a little bit, a little bit about James Conner and that. And then later in the show, we're talking to Ben uh, Valin from the Boston Globe, giving his thoughts on the Patriots. So uh, always appreciate his time but yeah to get to get back to Boswell I think it's just been a weird situation and the last couple of weeks everywhere everywhere has just been super weird you know I it, usually on on Tuesdays that's when you bring tryout guys in that's kind of the standard operating procedure for for most teams Tuesday is the heavy tryout day and so I would have expected and Tomlin confirmed they were going to bring guys in and work them out no guarantee they'd be signed I'm totally cool with that um, I expected to hear something by the end of Tuesday. The Steelers were going to make their decision, either sign a new guy or roll with Boswell for the time being. And according to the NFL official logs from the people we've talked to, Howard, Bob, Bob, excuse me, Howard Balzer, um, who's done a, a great job of reporting this stuff, said the Steelers did not report of anyone working out uh, Tuesday. So if it happens, it'll happen Wednesday or I guess Thursday. And, and that seems weird to me to kind of let this stuff linger yeah, everyone's kind of walking on an eggshell, so they're going to make a move or they're not going to make a move. Um, and then the reality is if you want to sign a guy, you got to get him into practice as early as possible because they got to work with the operation with the long snapper and the holder. they got to do onside kick stuff. So I, I'm surprised that they have not even uh, worked anybody out yet. And and we're assuming that they haven't worked anybody yeah. out yet. I mean, right. we're, we're, you know, look, the, sometimes if you miss the deadline, that's not going to get reported on that sheet, and thus guys like Howard Ball, Balls are, uh, you know, are, are not going to be able to pass mm-hmm. it along. So all we can do is because no, 
no tryout players were filed yesterday is assume, I guess, that it didn't happen. So uh, I mean, we'll, we'll see. Like, like I said, by 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 this afternoon, uh, if, if well, really probably even sooner than that, because you would think uh, they would want a kicker at practice today, right? So uh, maybe they had an early morning workout. And to be quite honest with you, I don't think, I mean, have you looked at Twitter this morning? I mean, we haven't seen the Steelers announce an official move yet. Normally, mm-hmm. they like to do so by, you know, 9, nine or, or 10, you know, Eastern time. That hasn't happened yet. So, yeah. you know, may, 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 maybe Boz is going to survive one more week. And I will say this. Look, if he does survive this week, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> Steelers can't, you, know, you get what you get, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, I understand Tomlin's point of there are not a lot of good options at kicker out there. Sure, sure, I, I get that, but I think this guy, I really think he's damaged goods. I mean, yeah. I I really think he's damaged good. I think it's the whole, you know, mental thing, you know, whatever it is, he's got it and he's had it, and I don't see how you, you know, uh, look, I... I could, I, I, there's no way I could do what he could do, but I, I tell you what, in a couple of weeks, I could probably learn what the proper mechanics are associated with it and at least have that down. So, I mean, if this thing isn't so much mechanics driven, you know, which, which it has to be, I mean, you're either putting your foot on the right spot on the ball and following through or what, you know, but what I'm saying here is these things with, with kickers, you know, as many as he as he's missed, it's, it would be kind of a surprise to see him all of a sudden correct this thing uh, the rest of the way. And, and one other quick note on that. Five of his six misses this year of field goals have come with the game either tied or the Steeders trailing. So oh. I, I've got the perfect fix, Alex. Just don't send them out there. <laughs> Just, <laughs> Just don't on, trail. Uh, yeah, don't trail or be tied. Send them out yep. there only when you lead and the problem solved, and they can they can thank me for that. Uh, do you bill hourly? Or <laughs> is that a no, hourly no, that, it, I, that that's uh, that's a that that's a give me there. Wow, you're too kind. Uh, do you think ultimately they make a change? I know we don't know, and maybe maybe we'll know by the time people listen to this. But do you think Boswell's the kicker against New England? I mean, it's gotten this late now. I uh, I think he will be the kicker now. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at Twitter right now. I'm not seeing any transactions, and it's Wednesday at, at, at 10 o'clock Eastern time, and normally we have the transactions reported by now. So yeah. Well, it uh, either happens either now or like at 4 at the deadline. Yeah. So I, I, I think it could still happen later this afternoon. I, I guess. I, I'm going to go ahead and hedge my bet. Based off just the Twitter machine alone, so I, I'm going to say he's he's going to be he he will be the kicker. How about you? Yeah, I thought I thought when Thomas comments post game uh, after the, the Oakland loss really signaled that it was going to be the end of Boswell, but now I'm not so sure. I I, I just they kind of work somebody out. I'm, I'm really floored. I know I shouldn't. I mean, maybe I'm clutching my pearls here a little bit, but I'm really surprised that at least as it appears they didn't work anyone out yesterday when Tomlin said they will and. Tuesday's the the usual tryout day, and 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 just to, to branch off of that for a quick tangent, you know, I, I was doing some research on tryout Tuesdays and stuff like that yesterday, and I came across a good article from Football Educator, um, which was written by former Denver Broncos uh, GM Ted Sunquist, and you know, he had a a big stack of data from '97 to 2007, so I know it's a little outdated, but it showed the tryout numbers year by year, and the Steelers had the fourth fewest tryout players over that span and that's you know a pretty good chunk of Colbert's tenure and I felt like it's still the same case today where the Steelers rarely try out guys much below the below average you rarely hear them connected with any tryout guys and that's always been frustrating to me because that's how you find diamonds in the rough that's how they find Mike Hilton who initially had a tryout before signing a futures contract so I just feel like you know maybe one reason why depth sometimes hurts and I know tryouts are a crap shoot and usually you don't find somebody but I just feel like that's one aspect of this team that they don't do necessarily enough that you know, to keep them in step with the rest of the league. Yeah. That's my I, opinion anyway. Yeah, I mean, well, look, I mean, they they, they they like to keep that roll decks full, you know, for, for the most part. And uh, I assume they've already got a nice list put together for, for, for the futures contracts, guys. And, and like it or not, they've done a good job with these futures guys, uh, you know, over the last several years, right? I mean – uh, filers come out of that, right? Mike Hilton, he has he come out of that? I think Roosevelt. Yeah, 
uh, uh, Roosevelt Knicks came out, came out of the futures group. So, I mean, where, where are you wanting them to work these guys? I mean, what, what what's your main beat? Just because they're not the, – the numbers aren't coming through the door? Yeah, I just think it's an asset, the way that it was outlined in the article. But, I mean, and, yeah, you're, it's a good point. They have found diamonds in the rough. It's not like they haven't, but I just feel like it's another tool that it feels like they're not using as, as much as other teams. But that's just – you know, it's, it's minor, obviously, in the, in the grand scheme of things right now. And, and we know this team isn't one that, that highly uh, flips a practice squad either, you know. Uh, unless injury, you know, you need the extra body. There, It's not like they're – some of these teams will flip two or three guys a week, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Steelers aren't like that. They have a lot of, you know, I guess loyalty to these guys, maybe to a fault sometimes. But uh, uh, I, I – I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I don't I don't find your argument <laughs> very, very – I'm throwing a flag. I'm calling BS on your argument. I, I think they do uh, – you bring them in when you need them, and you keep the roll decks full, and, and you go from there. All right. Fair enough. Let's uh, let's get to more relevant topics. I know I got a, I got a sidetrack there. Say so about that for Wednesday. Uh, the injury report came out, and again, unfortunately, a lot of names on on the list. Dave, do you want to uh, read off? You know who, who's showing up for this week? Yeah, and really not as long as what we thought. I mean, Ben, Ben, and we'll get on that in a little bit here. Ben with some ribs, uh, bruised ribs, ended up being you know what came out of the MRI after he got back to Pittsburgh there. Uh, Mike Tomlin said it's going to be a pain management thing. We'll talk to Mel a little bit about that here a- after a while. Uh, it looks like Ben's not going to practice on Wednesday uh, today. That's not a surprise there. Uh, James Conner, uh, uh, Tomlin sounding more. Look, Jerry Dulac, you, you go all the way back to, to Sunday. There were some reports. It must be great to be a major media guy when no, no one can really question your re- reports uh, every week. It seems like these guys, these major media guys, make a lot of this crap up uh, on there. Look, we had reports on both sides of the fence. You know, uh, he's he, he he might play, he may not play. How great is that to to write to to uh, <laughs> release breaking news? James Conner may or may not play against the Patriots. Uh, <laughs> that was what Schefter, I think, right? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it was all three of them. It was Lock and Four. It was uh, Ian Rappaport, and you know, all three of them mm-hmm. by by the time those games kicked off had some degree of either optimism or pet pessimism pessimism when it comes to uh, James Conner there now Jerry Dulac I think it was later on was it Sunday later on Sunday I think it was that they said James Conner is considered doubtful uh, but Mike Tomlin painted a little bit more more rosier picture when it came to James Conner. He says, uh, James Conner with his ankle, he had a really impressive week last week. We will see what this week holds and obviously his avail- availability being based on first his health and then his preparedness. So, you know, we'll, we'll see on Wednesday. I would think that James Conner needs to do something <clears throat> today in, in, in practice you know, and, and in the day by limited uh, if he's going to play come this weekend. If he if he if he sits out practice Wednesday, that that's just not a great sign when it comes to him. And of course the same goes for Marcus Gilbert, who Mike Tomlin really didn't have much of an update on him. He basically says he uh, he hadn't checked with him. Uh, he thinks he's down downstairs as we speak, getting a workout in today. And then Mike Tomlin goes on to say some other bumps and bruises uh, associated with play. We will sort through those things as we get into our work week. So I would expect <clears throat> you know a few of your veteran days off today. Mm-hmm. You know, um, uh, Marquise Pouncey, maybe Joe Hayden. Uh, obviously, Ben's not going to work today. Uh, we'll see if any other kind of surprises show up in there. Gilbert probably not going to practice. We'll see. Uh, and then, of course, Connor will be uh, Connor will probably be the biggest name to watch, barring there not being any surprises on there. Yeah, I still think it's going to be tough for Connor to go this week. I, I am a little more optimistic than I was, you know, last Tuesday when Tomlin ruled him out. And usually that kind of signals a multi-week thing. Um, ankle sprains can be unpredictable. Usually that's a bad thing, but sometimes that's a good thing as well. Um, and I know that Dr. Mel had some insight on on Connor's injury and kind of some surprising data on on ankle sprains. So I know we didn't talk a ton about Ben and Connor, you know, off the top, and that's kind of been some of the big stories. But uh, we're saving that for the, the Mel interview because we talked about that extensively then. So Dave, you want to jump into our, our discussion with Dr. Mel? Uh, yeah, we can. But overall, real quick, uh, mm-hmm. well, no, let, let, we'll, we'll go ahead and jump to to uh, to Dr. Mel here. Okay, let's uh, talk to our, our, our Steeler fan and, 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 and girl surgeon, Dr. Melanie Friedlander. 
All right, welcome back to the Terrible Podcast, and we are pleased to be joined with a, if you listen to this show long enough, you've read Steeders Depot and you've been on the Twitter machine uh, and, and, and you know, read me there, you obviously know who our next guest is. She's been on the Terrible Podcast before. Uh, unfortunately, when she comes on, we're talking about injuries or whatnot, but even so, we are more than happy to have her expertise. She's great at what she does. I'm, of course, talking about Melanie Friedlander. We call Caller, Dr. Mel. Uh, Mel, welcome back to the Terrible Podcast and fill us in a little bit about what you do from nine to nine. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. As always, it is such a pleasure. And I was so happy the first half of the season when I had absolutely nothing to write about and talk about for injuries. And now we're in the thick of it. And unfortunately, they start to pile up a little bit. Um, it, I wish it were 99. It's more like 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. But uh, I'm a general surgeon in beautiful Southern California uh, by day and uh, Steelers fan 24-7. There you go. There you go. And obviously we're having you on because the big story right now, or one of the many big stories right now uh, with the Steelers, of course, uh, is is Ben Roethlisberger, his rib injury, and how the Steelers and, and Mike Tomlin handled him uh, during the game on Sunday against the Raiders, and particularly after halftime when Ben not, did not come out of the locker room right away, didn't come out until about eight-something left in the third quarter. He obviously uh, uh, stood on the sidelines for the force or, you know, through the fourth series of that Joshua Dobbs had ran, then the Steelers finally put it, put him in at that point. Now, today we heard Mike Tomlin uh, and Ben as well, uh, Ben during his radio show and Mike Tomlin during his, during his press conference talk about how what all transpired there behind the scenes. Evidently, Ben... You know, uh, had problems finding his way to the lock or, or to the X-ray room. Uh, the X-ray room in, in in Oakland Alameda Stadium, but probably something now the 1940s. Uh, in, in other words, it was termed kind of antiquated. They couldn't get a good uh, X-ray. They couldn't figure out what exactly may have been the the issue with with Ben. Uh, by now, all of you listening should know most of the backstory. So, with that, Dr. Mel. Uh, let me stop talking and, and, and basically say, where are you on all this storyline right now? And in your expert opinion, you know, could and should Ben have been back in the game earlier than what he was? Well, honestly, I think there are two completely conflicting ways to look at it. And one is me as a fan and one is me as a doctor and they still don't agree. Um, the All right, well, well, well throw, throw, throw the fan side <laughs> out. Throw the fan side out. Let's hear, let's, <laughs> let, let, let's, hear, let's hear the doctor side. Okay, so the doctor side is this. Um, obviously, I wasn't, you know, in the locker room with Ben. Hey, if you look at Pro Football Docs on, on Twitter, he actually outlines how hideous the trek is from the visitor locker room to the x-ray machine, and it's insane. So I understand it probably took till the end of halftime before they actually had an x-ray to look at. What the doctors are looking for at that point is to see if there's any broken ribs. Ben obviously took a sack on the third and eight late in the uh, fourth quarter, I believe. Second quarter. And second quarter, sorry. And then, you know, obviously continue to play through the half. Um, And they're looking for fractures. They want to make sure there's no broken bones. If the lower ribs are broken, then you also have to worry that the spleen could be injured. The spleen is a solid organ in the upper abdomen on the left. And if a, if a, rib is broken, it can injure the spleen, and that can be life-threatening bleeding. So here you have your doctors, they're with Ben, they're in a locker room, and by all of reports, their x-rays are inconclusive. That's not a great situation. But you can also look at that and say inconclusive means there's no obvious fractures. And really what they want to see is there's no obvious separation of the bones. So however bad the x-rays were, they were good enough to tell that. At that point, the doctors are probably just using clinical judgment. I'm guessing that Ben's pain was high enough on the chest that they felt comfortable that it wasn't a lower rib injury, that, you know, it was not a risk of bleeding or, or any intra-abdominal injuries. And that's the point where they decide to clear him. He also probably got some pain medication. I think I saw it reported somewhere that he did in fact get what they call a pain shot, which almost certainly would be Toradol. Toradol is one of the most commonly used medications in the NFL and most pro sports. 
it's an NSAID. So it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It's like the very best Motrin you can ever have in a syringe. So whether Ben got that in the, as an IV dose or as an intramuscular dose, uh, it would have been taking effect easily by the time he's back in his pads and back on the sideline. All right. Uh, from, so, from, the, from, from there, uh, what, you know, what's, what's the time frame that he should have been at known or the, uh, let's say it's inconclusive. And, and Dr. Bradley said, look, yo, it could be one of three. And, and, and this was kind of part of the quotes today. It could be like one of three things, you know, we, we just don't know for sure what's going on in there. You know, obviously probably want to evaluate him for a little bit there, but at what point would he possibly been medically cleared to go back into the game should they have chosen to go that route? And could I, I, I mean, how, when would they have known if he would have done, you know, the, the talk was, was, well, you know, maybe they don't want him to do a little bit more damage until they get a better look at him. But at the same time, Dan, Tomlin's kind of damning comment was, you know, we felt like we could put him back in if we needed to win the game. <laughs> exactly. Probably the worst thing he could have said. Absolutely. And so, I, I pointed that on Twitter, and I really think that was the most damning thing that Mike Tomlin said today. There's no question about that. And, you know, Fangirl Melanie went to town on that. But as a physician, okay, so I'm in Dr. Bradley's shoes. I've got this x-ray that is inconclusive because it's such a poor piece of equipment. Probably was bought around the same time as Al Davis's overhead projector. And I think Ben's okay, but I can't be 100% sure. So at that point, I have three options. Number one, I can send Ben to the hospital. Obviously, that's overkill. He's not in any, in any distress. Um, but if they wanted better x-rays, that's the option. Uh, number two, I can just rule them out and say, you know what? We can't be 100% sure, so we're just going to shut them down for the day. Number three, and this is a completely acceptable option for doctors, use your clinical judgment. If you think that he's not in any danger to return to the field, you're in the treatment room, in the x-ray room. That's where you make that decision. You're not going to watch him for another 20 minutes before you make up your mind. And as much as I would love to say, well, they had to wait and see and watch, I really just don't think that's true. I think Ben walks out to the field with his helmet, and at that point, Bradley has already said he's good to go back in. So that's how he was cleared, Mel? I mean, because that, that was my question. I know you just kind of addressed it, but, you know, he wasn't – the x-ray was in, inconclusive. They didn't know exactly what was going on. How do you go from that to being medically clear to go back into the game? Is that is that the process, the clinical judgment, and the context clues without having a definitive x-ray? Exactly. Without having been in that room, I would assume that once they look at those x-rays and see that there's no obvious fractures, meaning that the ribs aren't lined up properly with each other mm-hmm. – then, you know, they examine Ben's chest and they can tell that there's no bony deformity and he's just tender and sore. Well, at that point, you're like, OK, you've got a bad bruise. And, you know, in in this day and age, we're so reliant on MRIs. There isn't an injured player that doesn't get an MRI Sunday night or Monday after, you know, coming off the field. But it is OK for a doctor to, to make a clinical judgment if a patient is otherwise OK and my best guess is that that's what Dr. Bradley did. You know, he said, Mm -hmm. there's no obvious fracture. There's no obvious injury. We wish we had a better x-ray, but for, for everything we can see standing in front of us, you're okay to play. So they they get a, it's easier. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to get a next question, but I'll let you finish your thought. So I think where the discrepancy comes in is it's one thing for the doctor to say, Ben is cleared to play. It's, it's easier almost for the doctor to make that decision than for the head coach to make that decision. Now you can say as a head coach, the doctor said he's clear to play, put him back in, end of story. And fangirl Melanie would have said, yeah, put him back in. <laughs> so with fanboy but, Alex. Right. Because clearly the defense and the kickers weren't doing their job, but that's for your podcast. I don't need to go there. I understand where Tomlin was struggling with this. I mean, we're talking about a coach who cares passionately about his players Ryan Clark years ago almost died in Denver. And once his spleen and gallbladder were out, he had multiple evaluations at altitude by multiple doctors who all said he is okay to play in Denver from now on. And twice the Steelers went out to Denver and twice they sat Ryan Clark on the bench because Tomlin said he wouldn't take a risk with him. Mm -hmm. This is who Tomlin is. He cares about his players. And so if there's any way he can spare a player from potential risk, he's going to do that. And I really think that was the gamble Tomlin took. And he's never going to say that at a podium. 
and Ben's never going to say that at podium. That's not something that they can admit. You know, Mm -hmm. Ben would have gone in if Tomlin told him to. I have no doubt in my mind about that. I mean, my goodness, Haloti Nana broke his nose so badly he turned it sideways and Ben didn't even miss a snap, right? Mm -hmm. This is a tough guy. We saw him hobble on that ankle in the 49ers game years ago, and it was excruciating. I I never questioned Ben Roethlisberger's toughness. So if Tomlin had said, get out there, he would have gone out there. In my opinion, he was clearly uncomfortable when he went back to play. Um, if you watch him, you know, he gets the touchdown to Juju. He doesn't jog off the field. He kind of walks off slowly and he does his little pointing to the sky, never raises his elbow above his shoulders. So mm-hmm. I do think that he was hurting, but I also am quite sure that if Tomlin had said it's time to go out there, he would have. I think Tomlin was conflicted and I, I understand that. I don't like it, but I totally get it. Sure. That makes sense. So, so they get the x-ray, I guess, Monday, and they see that it's just several bruised ribs is what Tomlin called it. If you were the, if you were the team doctor this week, what precautions are you taking with Ben? How much would you practice him? I know there's no definitive answer based on the limited knowledge we have of the injury, but what precautions are you taking during the week in game? Is this a multi-week thing? I'm with bruised ribs. I assume that it is. What's the process getting ready and then playing against the Patriots? So as much as I would love to see Ben practicing tomorrow, my guess is he doesn't. Um, The the basics, of course, you know, I... It's it's Wednesday. He don't practice anyway. (laughs) He did last week. Uh, (laughs) Wait, wait, no. I I, to practice handing the ball off to the little baby running backs, but still. (laughs) I'm I'm trying to remember. No, I don't don't know if he did or not last week. I think he did. He did. Did did he? Did he? Okay, yeah, maybe he did. Absolutely. But that was the first time he's done it in a while. Yeah, I know. So my guess is Ben doesn't practice Wednesday. I assume that he'll be limited Thursday and then probably a full go Friday. You know, rib injuries don't limit what you can do. It just doesn't feel good when you do it. You know, I put out on Twitter earlier today, I had, I played, you know, rugby at the college level with a couple cracked ribs and it was not pleasant, but it doesn't mean you can't play. It just hurts. It hurts to breathe. It hurts to move. It hurts to throw, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it. And I I think, you know, it's not going to affect his, his touch, his accuracy. It's just going to feel really bad. Now on the bright side, it's his left arm it's his left chest. So I think that will be less of an issue for his throwing arm. Mm -hmm. Um, So I assume, you know, ice rest, um, anti-inflammatory medications, probably going to be all he'll do. I mean, you can, you can tape the ribs, but if they're not broken, it probably won't help at all. Um, as far as Sunday goes and pain management, that's the big question. You can give local anesthesia blocks. So, you know, prior to the game, they can give an injection that will numb up that area of his chest. And, you know, I don't think it's going to change his awareness or, or perception of any new injury, um, but it could give him some pretty significant pain relief during the game. So I wouldn't be surprised if they did that. Mel, I think, uh, uh, I think what most people are struggling with right now, and I know I kind of am is, you know, if he was good, if he was healthy enough to go back into that game, you know, and, and supposedly that was going to happen, whether or not the Raiders scored their first go ahead touchdown. Uh, yeah, in other words, this did the, the uh, you know the second to the last series that Ben did go on and drive the field. Him and Tomlin had already had the talk that he was going back into the game, regardless of what the Raiders did. I kind of a I, a I kind of find that hard to believe, but okay. Uh, I think the thing people are struggling with now is, all right, if he is good enough to play, then why wasn't he good enough to play? Uh, right after the second series ended, or even in the middle of the second series when he comes out of the locker room, uh, by God, that's Ben Roethlisberger's music, you know? Uh, why, <laughs> why, why, why wasn't he? Why wasn't he? In, you know, considered good enough to go in then? You know, it, it, to me, this and I said this on a podcast the other day, and I still kind of stand by this. To me, it was like, okay, well, look, you don't want to maybe get him hurt a little bit more. You know, defense. We're, we're in the lead of this game. You know, we'll trust the defense. Trust Joshua Dobbs can close this thing out. And then after four drives of Dobbs <laughs> not being able to do anything, then you then you hit the old crap moment and say, Ben, get out there. I, I think that's the thing most people are probably struggling with, uh, with Ben coming in when he did, uh, as opposed to, you know, when he came out of the locker room with eight minutes left in the third quarter. Let me just say that I apologize in advance. I'm about to make a very damning comment. 
Ben should have been out on the field as soon as he was cleared by the doctors and as soon as he was on the sideline. And if that meant getting in halfway through that second drive that Dobbs was running, Ben should have been under center. I, I, I agree with you. I, and that's I, and Alex, where do you I mean, where do you come in on this? I mean, knowing what we know now and obviously all three of us still probably don't know everything as much as we listened to Tomlin and Roethlisberger talk today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm of the camp that if you're medically clear, and the doctors have given you the OK, you trust your doctors, you trust their information you get in the game. Now, I can understand the other perspective and be sympathetic of you know Tomlin has to think about more than just the football aspect his player the risk of injury what happens if Ben gets hit again and worsens the injury or something happens Tomlin's going to get chewed out that way so there is like Mel said earlier a confliction but ultimately if you're medically cleared you trust your doctors that's why they're there you put Ben back in the game well and the thing too Mel Mel you can speak to this I mean May could there have been maybe they wanted to evaluate him for for maybe a full you'll have another full 30 minutes pass or so because that technically I guess from the time he took the sack till until you know the the time that he came uh, out of the locker room may have been what about a full uh, 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 as far as the clock goes a full hour uh, I, I don't know I would have to go back in time at all could they have been maybe because they had the uncertainty, you know, with with uh, the X-rays and all like that, as far as a clinical diagnosis, like you talked talked about there, could maybe they wanted to see X amount of time go by to see if he uh, suffered, you know, this that or you know other symptoms and all. Is that a possibility in your professional opinion? Oh, boy, I wish I could answer that with an affirmative because it would vindicate Tomlin, but. I can't. I think that I honestly believe that waiting and watching gave you absolutely nothing. And if you put him out there and he's too uncomfortable or he can't throw the ball, then you've answered your question and you get Dobbs back out. But I think watching him on the sideline standing, you know, with a baseball hat on doesn't give you any clinical information that's useful at all. I, I don't think they were worried about a pulmonary contusion blossoming, meaning like a, a a bruise on the lung. I don't think they were worried about any occult bleeding where he would have suddenly felt weak. I honestly think that Tomlin was trying to protect him and he rolled the dice and he thought Dobbs was going to get them the win and gambled wrong. I don't think it was anything to do with watching Ben a little longer and seeing how he did. That, that's where I'm at. So I totally agree with you, Mel. Just, I just had one last question coming off Ben for a second. Uh, James Conner with the ankle injury, you know, missed last week. Tomlin didn't rule him out this week, which is a positive sign. Although Tomlin basically will not rule anybody out who still has a leg. Um, so with Conner, what does he have to show coaches and trainers? What are the, the process to, for him to possibly come back and play against New England? So – I have a track record of predicting patient uh, players coming back a little earlier than they usually do, and I tend to be a bit optimistic on things. But I could use the, Steelers Nation could use some optimism <laughs> right now. So fire away. All right, are you ready? Here's I'm even standing up right now. Here's my optimism because I'm going to get in the locker room. I'm going to rally everybody. The video you posted today from Tevin Jones' Instagram, where Connor was jumping up and down at the poolside, mm-hmm. he was jumping up and down on his right foot, fully weight bearing. And actually turning on his ankle a little bit. And that was the injured ankle. To me, that is the most optimistic sign I can imagine. So we still don't know if Connor has a high ankle sprain or a, or a regular ankle sprain. Mm-hmm. By video, it really looks like a high ankle. And it's, it's really classic for that. When they said contusion, I was like, what? So not surprised that it turns out to be an ankle sprain. Um, but I think it's pretty mild. And... You hear everybody automatically knee-jerk say six weeks for a high ankle sprain. But if you actually start to look at the data, and they've done some pretty extensive studies both on college athletes and NFL athletes, the average missed time on a high ankle sprain is actually, wait for it, 15.4 days. Hmm. Is, cut, possible. Is, is cutting the biggest issue for that, or is it both straight line and cutting that you have to show? Um, actually rotation is going to be the biggest issue because a high, and again, I don't know if he has a high ankle sprain or a low ankle sprain, but a low ankle sprain, it's the, it's the ligaments that attach the, the two bones between the knee and the ankle to the actual ankle. And it's the sort of outer rotation where the foot turns out that gives you the biggest problem. Um, that's not as big an issue for a running back, but the high ankle sprain is an injury to the ligaments that connect the, both the tibia and the fibula right above the ankle. 
And that's where the rotation really is a factor. So that has to heal before he can cut. And obviously that's going to be a key to him playing. Well, will he get any, uh, assume, let, let's assume and it's dangerous to do with, with, with him right now. Let's assume he suits up for the game against the Patriots. Uh, will, he, will he get anything pain wise before, before the game or anything along, along those lines? I wouldn't. I wouldn't because you can, I mean, everything that we do has risk and reward, right? So you give somebody a, a intercostal block in their chest, there's probably not a lot of risk to that. I could see them doing that for Ben. You give somebody an injection in their ankle, you can cause bleeding, you can cause inflammation. And, and again, I don't think I want him to have a numb ankle. I want him to be aware of everything his foot is doing. So I think with Connor, if he plays, he's just going to have to gut it out. All right, fair enough. And we'll know Wednesday, we'll know Wednesday afternoon after practice, the first injury report comes out and uh, probably expect Ben to be a do not participate. And we'll have to see. Hopefully, Connor, it can at least be limited. And hopefully the bumps and bruises associated with play from the game against the Raiders uh, doesn't uh, create any any surprises on the injury report. Mel, any other final thoughts uh, 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 you know, as far as what, what all has transpired this past week? Oh, my goodness. Um, Do we have any other injuries? I mean, are we ever going to see Marcus Gilbert take the field? I don't know. <laughs> I, know I, I, I think, I think we will. Really, I, yeah. re- <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. The Steelers have gotten annoyingly good at hiding their players. I actually reached out to one of the beat reporters at, on Gilbert, and I was like, hey, what's going on? And he said, we haven't seen him in weeks. So social media has, has caused Tomlin to, like, take his little players and hide them from us. It's really hard to know what the heck's going on. I mean, thank goodness for a couple of Instagram videos, but Marcus Gilbert has been invisible. So I, I, I have to assume the fact that he hasn't gone on IR yet means that they really do think he's going to be okay and come back. But my goodness, it's been a long time. Yeah, I don't know what. I mean, the Tomlin treats these like, you know, state secrets or whatnot. And, and you know, look, I mean, he, <laughs> you, you get rolled out on Friday anyway. You know, but I mean, other teams, they, they can look at these practice reports. And now with the new rules on, on the injury designation and what can be limited and questionable and, and, and doubtful, and there is no more probable and all, I'm pretty sure people got a pretty good uh, idea what, when a guy is listed, you know, to, to close out the week, whether or not they think he's got a shot uh, at playing. I'm talking about opponents as well, too. Well, uh, Mel, look uh we appreciate having you on again uh uh unfortunately we have to talk about you know things associated with with Steelers and injuries when we do do that but uh no other person I would rather have do it than you and if people are not already following Mel on Twitter shame on you it's at girl surgeon uh Melanie really from from uh, Alex and I we really appreciate having you on today Well, as always, thank you so much for having me on. It's always so much fun. Again, thank you to Dr. Melanie Friedlander. Dave, she is fantastic. It's it's we're so lucky to have that kind of resource and, and insight from her. I'm one lucky dude, am I not? I mean, uh, <laughs> yep. uh, you know, to have her uh, and her expertise for for the site. And look, I mean, yeah, you know, we actually interviewed her Tuesday night, and you know, she uh, she fit us right on in. So we certainly do appreciate. She's an incredible asset, and and uh, look, if you're not following on her on Twitter. She mm-hmm. she knows her football too. I mean, you should let, let let's get that out there. So yep. uh, you know, make sure you follow her on Twitter at Girl Surgeon uh, Mel. We love you. Thanks for coming on. And I think is she writing about James Conner in an article? I think maybe sometime this week if she can get away, get some time. Yeah, she is, and okay, hopefully cool. we will have that in the next couple of days as well too. Awesome. So yeah, now great insight from her as always. And and yeah, you know, expect Ben to play play hurt, but he'll, he'll play. And then Connor. Uh, I appreciate her, her optimism there. So, Dave, you said we had a couple of reader emails you wanted to get to? Yeah, yeah, we do. The uh, the, the email box has been filling up <laughs> as, <laughs> uh, as of late, especially after this uh, loss. And that's How many of those are Fire Tomlin? Yeah, I mean, there, there's some nasty ones in here for sure. Let's, uh, let's start off one I got from a Brian Lando. Uh, he says, hey, guys, obviously not calling a timeout after the uh, Roberts catch or even their first down run was coaching mal- malpractice tomlin's excuse was that he wanted the timeout for our offense but no one is really hitting this point 
We had two timeouts. He's acting like we had one. He could have called one timeout and saved the other. And even worse, the broadcast missed this, but they actually called the timeout after an incompletion. So not only did they not stop the clock, they wasted a timeout for our offense. It is bad uh, clock management issues you can have unreal. Uh, Brian, we uh, we talked a little bit about this, I think, on the on the, on the Monday show, and Mike Tomlin once again addressed the the uh, the time, you know, why he didn't use a timeout. Uh, during his press conference uh, on Tuesday, and I'm trying to find the uh, the the, uh, the direct quote here. Uh, in so many words, you know, he said, "I want to read this thing directly here." Uh, okay, he says uh, he was asked, uh, "Did he consider using a timeout after the two-minute mark after they hit the big play down the field, or, or following the Raiders' first run?" He says, "I did, but to be quite honest with you, I, I chose not to. I was more interested in stopping them. Uh, particularly, I knew if I didn't utilize the timeout, that the run game would be an element of the se- sequence, and I felt comfortable about our ability to stop the run. I was more interested in winning the sequence, or less interested in the number of timeouts I was holding if we were to lose the sequence." We had our chances. Uh, we had our chances. We got them in fourth down, fourth down and six. We utilized the timeout to put ourselves in a very best call and have discussions that we thought were pertinent to, to winning in the circumstance. We liked the people that we had on the field. We liked the call we had. They executed better than we did. So such is life. Uh, he goes Most on. To, that's just noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he, you know, he goes on to say that he wanted the, the timeout so they could utilize. The, the middle of the field for the offense, and that you know that's the way he does things, and yada yada. Uh, and I wrote I wrote about this yesterday yesterday again after Mike Tomlin had had had, had you know talked about this. Uh, you can dice this thing up several ways. Uh, I understand a little bit where Tomlin's coming from about kind of wanting to force a run, but even if you call a timeout, aren't you going to force a run? In other words, let's say he did not call a timeout after the Roberts catch, uh, because look, you're only going to burn X. You at some point they're going to be able to run some clock, right? Mm-hmm. At at least 39 seconds, which uh, which uh, or actually probably at least 44 seconds, which is a five second play and 39 seconds of the 40 second clock, right? Mm-hmm. So at some point they're probably going to be able to run. That, that section of, of time off. So let's say after the big completion down the field to Roberts, uh, you know, you don't call a timeout because you're wanting to force a run. They run on first down like they did, and they gain, what, just a few yards and five seconds come off the clock. If you call timeout then, aren't you Aren't you more likely to force another run in that you know second and what was it then, Alex? Second and second and goal from like the five. From from like the five, aren't you maybe more likely because let's see there was one how how much time when when Roberts caught the ball one fifty ish one fifty one. Yeah. Okay, right and let's right. let's say they ran that down to when 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 did they get the playoff? Like uh, one twelve was the second and goal play. All right, so one twelve. And then one, let's say 107, you get the, the stop after the first run, right? Mm-hmm. Are they, would they, or would they not be more likely to run on second and goal? Because the Raiders still had one timeout at that point, right? Yeah, I, I have no idea. I think trying to guess what the opponent's going to do, run pass, is irrelevant here. You need to work. You need to focus on the time and the clock. And so I think after that second and goal run, you need to take your time out and, and, and preserve some, some clock. After the first and goal run. Or after the first and goal run, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, yeah. because you, you have to take at least one time out there to save clock. You can't, you can't just let the clock run and run and run the way that he did. Because only, the only time out he used was after the incompletion before the fourth down play. And I know that his explanation is you want to take a look at what their offense is, is setting up. But it works the other way. The offense now looks at your defense and has an idea what you're doing too. So it, it doesn't really help you as much as you think. Right. That's kind of my thought on, on, on stop too. Yeah, you you get to – they roll out theirs. You roll out yours. You call a timeout. And then they can go back and talk about it just like you can. And the, right. touch, the touchdown play they ended up running – 
came from the Raiders week two game against the uh against the Denver Broncos in, in the first oh. in the first quarter to close out oh, wow. close out that drive. So props to them because look, I mean t- I imagine teams have cut ups of other teams in, in, in certain down distances and, and field locations and stuff like that. So that play probably was on a cut up that they had to study, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, uh, the, this uh, past week ahead of that game. But, yeah, that that's uh, that's where that play call came from there. And, and mm-hmm. you know, props to them for getting themselves in the right play and, and, and scoring in that situation. And, look, my, you know, make no mistake about it, Mike Hilton slipped. But if Mike yeah. Hilton doesn't slip, I, I'm not sure he still gets there, in, 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 you know, anyway. So, uh yeah. Uh, and who is that from Brian Lando? Brian, we, we certainly do appreciate that email one. Let me try to get uh sneak. Yeah, one, see one more, one, one more here. Andrew, Andrew, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. Congratulations. False F A L C E. Uh, let's say he goes, Hey, Dave and Alex, I'm 21 year old who, who's lived in Ohio almost all my life. Diehard Steelers fans, thanks to my dad who was raised in Pittsburgh. I've uh, been a devout listener for almost a year now. Figured I'd finally send an email with some comments. First of all, you do, guys do a great job. Rotate through these uh, uh, podcasts, but the terrible podcast is far far and away the best. Uh, let's see. First big question here. I have his Ben has 13 INTs this season, but I'm curious how many of those the ball was intended for a B. Uh, well, I tell you this <laughs> quite, a, uh, I think all of the, uh, the red zone ones were, uh, Matthew marks. He actually had these all broke all, all the turnover worthy throws, Andrew done on the site. Uh, and you know, I, I, Alex, can you pull up, pull up the play-by-play maybe real quick to see who, who intended for her? But uh, he realized A.B. is one of, if not the best receivers in the league, but he feels like Ben really forces some errant passes into un- undesirable situations with, with him. Yeah, you, you are right, I mean, especially in the red zone. I mean, if you go back and look at these red zone inter- interceptions, Andrew, <laughs> uh, most, if not all of them, have been targeted uh, to, uh, to A.B. in those situations there. As far as the other ones, I mean, look, you go back to the Cleveland game that one day, down the middle of the miscommunication. I know that was intended uh, for for A B. So yeah, a lot of them are intended for A for A B. Does Ben force them in certain situations? I, I think we saw that, and, and Alex and I, I think even talked about in this game uh, against the Raiders here, and it was really two balls for for Juju. Uh, I think that early pitch and catch that was high to Juju. If you go back and watch that one, if Juju doesn't come down with that one, that one's going right over his head and right into the arms of, of a Raiders defender. And then the uh, you know the 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 uh, the touchdown late from Ben to Juju. It's a, you go back and watch that from the what did you think about that from the coaches uh, from 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 the end zone angle, Alex? Did what's that? What what did you think about that one from you know the uh, the all the touchdown almost interception from the end zone angle against the Raiders? Yeah, it was it was a Just, mistake. It, yeah, I mean, just as close there. But anyway, yeah. uh, we we get what you're, where you come from, uh, Andrew. He says next uh, Monday you both were talking about future needs this off season. Weird scenario, but say we were guaranteed a per- perennial Pro Bowler in the first and a constant above average player in the second. Meaning, whoever we take in the first uh, becomes a stud, and whoever you take in the second becomes an above average starter. What position would you address, not including? quarterback he said personally he'd go off uh, outside linebacker and then in the first and probably a free safety strong safety in the second outside linebacker because we haven't had a true threat uh there uh, he goes watt looks solid but he isn't a huge threat bud seems like an average starter i, I kind of get to just without reading the, the rest of this whole thing uh where he's going with uh look alex and i kind of addressed this the other day as well too and you know whether or not we are guaranteed a perennial pro bowler in the first or not, uh, probably inside linebacker right now. Uh, and, and I am a guy that likes, to, you know, likes the Steelers to try to draft seven outside linebackers uh, every year. Unfortunately, they haven't done that for me yet, but, uh, uh, you know, I do think they need another outside linebacker in this draft. I maybe not so much free or strong safety, right, Alex? I mean, they got Sean Davis and they got Edmonds, so I would expect safety to be be down the list this year. 
Yeah, I think I was thinking about that answer, that conversation we had, what position would you address first? And I, I kind of went inside linebacker, and that's certainly a big area, no doubt about it. But also, I, I think I would put corner at the top of that list. And one, in this hypothetical, because I'm guaranteeing a, a good player in the way the Seals have evaluated DBs, I'm going to take I'm going to take the guarantee there. But um, I, I think I can live with more of an LJ Ford Vince Williams combination than whatever they have at, at corner. And I just want that secondary splash player that they just haven't been able to find. So I think I might have corners slightly above inside linebacker, but you can rank him anyway. And it's tough to argue. And then just real quick to answer the original question. I don't have it for the whole season, but uh, Matthew's third quarter last four weeks, uh, turnover worthy throws of the seven that Ben has had that were turnover worthy, five of them intended for Antonio Brown. All right. Uh, one final note on his email here. He had a little on Jalen Samuels. Really like what he has done as a fifth round pick. He says you guys brought up uh, that he wasn't uh, wasn't a threat as a runner, but he sure looks good as a pass catcher. Even as a even as a running ability doesn't develop that well, he should still have that role in a rotation. Could use an upgrade over Ridley, though. Someone with some speed who can complement Connor's power. Yeah, I don't think you're going to get an argument out of us there, Andrew. Uh, the thing is. It'll be interesting, I think, to see how Samuels can develop as a true runner. Uh, we saw some great stuff out of him as a pass catcher against the Raiders. Uh, in fact, you know, some very good yak yards after catching those situations. That was impressive. Uh, I have no issues with him as a as a uh, a pass catcher. Once you know, obviously, you want to see him develop a little bit more as a pass protector in those situations, but I think the biggest question with him moving forward throughout the rest of this season and on into next season is how he does with the football in his hands as a running back. And yeah, Ridley, you know, Ridley's just uh, through this season kind of guy. Uh, I would like to see them maybe <clears throat> get one of those fourth or another uh, fifth or sixth round, kind of maybe a scat back, I I I I if you will, to kind of compliment these guys. But uh, great email, Andrew, and I uh, apologize if I uh, uh, mispronounce your last name. Well, th that's the risk you take when you send an email <laughs> to Dave Bryant. <laughs> that's assumed risk. Absolutely. Uh, Dave, it's going to be a little warmer in Pittsburgh this week, but I know for, for New England game Sunday, 425 game is going to probably be in the 30s by the time that game gets close to an end. So I think uh, it's a good time to mention our sponsor this week, Action Heat. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I like these Vegas mornings right now. This is my favorite Lucky time. You. You know, my, my favorite time. The best thing about living in Vegas, uh, you know, you get the, the three – three months of, of, of extreme heat, but otherwise, I mean, it's kind of San Diego-ish weather, if you will, you know, and, and this time, and look, I get up early. I like to, I like to walk outside, drink a cup of coffee and all, and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and get the dog, <laughs> dog outside. Is that, what, is that really what you do? Yeah, yeah, absolutely it is. Do you so. live in 19... 43 <laughs> <laughs> look i i, I it's, it's the little things in life brother you'll you'll Walk learn that both ways <clears throat> you, you you'll you'll uh, you'll realize it's the little things <laughs> the older you get you uh you think you got the tiger by the tail right now wait you just wait uh <laughs> uh but yeah you uh, look i mean i like to step step outside and be a little bit uh get slapped in the face with a little bit of that uh, uh cold nip first thing in the morning there and uh look uh if you live in a cold area, whether if you go to these games this time of year, uh, whatever you do outside, if it's cold, you need to be warm. And this episode is, of course, sponsored by Action Heat. Uh, Action Heat makes the world's best battery heated clothing. It's heat on the demand at the touch of a button, almost like the car, or it is like your car seat, your heated car seat uh, in these newer clothes. I mean, in the newer cars nowadays. Action Heat clothing is engineered to safely and efficiently deliver heat via heating panels similar to those in your heated car seats. They can reach temperatures up to 135 degrees and are powered by rechargeable 5 volt lithium ion batteries. I, you know, I think those are the kind of that are used in your cell phones there that last up to 12 hours. On on each charge 12 hours in a long time uh, action heat batteries can also be used to recharge your phone or any other gadget that you uh, wear you know, while you're wearing them so if you have your cell phone and and, and you and, and, and you need it you need some extra power you can hook these things up to your action heat clothing and, and recharge them it's perfect for any friend or family on your holiday gift list look it's getting late in this process right now 
If you haven't already ordered, you know, uh, gotten some of this, uh, some of the gifts for the special person on your list, you still have a lot of time right now. So, uh, perfect. Uh, these kind of action, action heat wear uh, clothing and, and, and gloves and hats and all are perfect for, for the person on your list that might spend some time outdoors quite a bit. Skiers, snowboarders, or anybody that loves the outdoors or hates being really, really cold like my wife. Action Heat Clothing provides toasty warmth and comfort for your whole body, including heated jackets, socks, gloves, hats, and even undergarments like heated base layer shirts and long johns. You can stay warm and cozy from head to toe with Action Heat. Action Heat is available also in men's and women's uh, sizes and has great new styles and models just released for this holiday winter season. So uh, you'll make your winter activities more enjoyable with a blast of warmth. Action Heat is a perfect solution to keep your you keep you toasty and warm even in the most frigid winter weather. Now look, Action Heat's got a great deal for our listeners here. We got a special deal, and you can save 20% off your entire order. What you have to do is you go to actionheat.com/terrible. Check out everything Action Heat has to offer. And they'll give you 20% off your order by using that URL. If you don't go that route, you want to just go to actionheat.com. Use the coupon code TERRIBLE once again at checkout to save 20%. So stay toasty, warm while you enjoy all your outdoor activities this winter with Action Heat. And we thank them. Uh, I think this is a final ad we're doing for them. We thank them for sponsoring the podcast. So make sure you, uh, you think about them when you're looking for that late holiday gift this year. Okay, Dave, good stuff. Let's uh, move to our eyes to Sunday now against New England, and I think we've had him on – how many times have we had Ben Valin on now, Dave? Several times this, over the last couple of years, correct? Yeah, quite a few. Not only, I think, with the Patriots, I think maybe before that, maybe had him on to talk when he covered the Dolphins, and I think I had a salary uh, or CBA question for him one time and had him on on a short segment as well, too. So needless to say, he's a friend of the podcast. Definitely one of our favorite guests to have on. You can follow him at Ben Valin, uh, V-O-L-I-N is the last name. And uh, so we had a great interview with him. Let's throw it to him and as he kind of breaks down what's going on up in Foxborough. All right. Back, welcome back to the Terrible Podcast. And it is, of course, Wednesday. That means we get a beat writer in who covers the opposing team the Steelers will play. And what seems to be the case the last several years, the Steelers are, of course, playing the Patriots once again. Uh, this coming Sunday, this game also going to be at Heinz Field. And we're uh, glad to have back on the show again. I think it's like his fourth or fifth appearance on a terrible podcast. I am, of course, talking about Ben Volan. He covers the uh, New England Patriots for the Boston Globe. Uh, you can follow Ben on Twitter, and you know what to do, uh, uh, listeners. You know, reach out to these guys on Twitter and let them know you heard them. Uh, but at Ben Volan, V O L I N, you can read all of Ben's work. Like I said, at Boston Globe. Dot com And Ben, welcome back to the Terrible Podcast. Thanks. I mean, I feel like at this point I should be given a, a hosting credit or something for this podcast, you know? Yeah, it's like uh, SNL. What, 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 the five-time hosting club or something? They all get the special, <laughs> uh, the special monogram robes or something like that. But, uh, yeah, Ben, look, uh, you're, you know, no stranger to, you're no stranger to Steelers Patriots. Uh, you covered them uh, for several years now, you know, after uh, uh, covering the Dolphins for so many years. Uh, speaking of which, that game must have been something for you to uh, to watch the other day uh, in Miami, a uh, close back and forth affair. The Patriots, of course, took the lead, uh, you know, fa- fairly late in the game, and then the Dolphins on the hook and uh, ladder play to to close it out. You know, uh, Bill Belichick really doesn't give you much after the games, but I know Tom Brady uh, gave, gave you quite a bit. What were your takeaways, and what was kind of your 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 uh, feeling uh, of the locker room on such a disappointing loss? Yeah, it, it was a wild game. Um, take the final play out of it for a second. Uh, there were nine lead changes throughout the game, just back and forth, a shootout, which you did not expect with a Dolphins offense that has not been very good this year. But uh, they came prepared, and they they came to play. And, and Miami's been kind of a house of horrors for Brady. Uh, he's lost five of his last six down there. Um, and you got to give the Dolphins all the credit in the world. They, they really came with a good game plan. Uh, Gash he didn't have a great – uh, game plan stopping Tom Brady in the offense. The the Patriots still put up 33, but uh, did a great job of of uh, hitting some chunk plays on, on the Patriots defense. 
Um, and then the final play was just bananas. I, I've never seen anything like that uh, in person. There have been a few crazy endings uh, over the years, but that re- rates right up there with one of the strangest you'll ever see. Um, it, it might. It, it feels almost like uh, karma a little bit. Uh, back in week seven, I think it was, the Patriots beat the Bears. But Mitchell Trubisky actually completed a Hail Mary on the final play, and the Patriots tackled the guy on the half-yard line and kept him out of the end zone to, to seal the win. So uh, they weren't so lucky this time. And, you know, the Patriots, they, they kind of brought this on themselves. Uh, forget putting Gronkowski out there instead of your arguably best defender in, in Devin McCourty on the final play. But they let uh, they let the Steelers hang around. They, they gave up the, the huge plays uh, on defense to uh, let the Dolphins score you know quickly up and down the field. Brady had a, a golden opportunity at the end of the first half. Um, to First, he missed a wide-open Chris Hogan in the end zone. Then he took a sack on third down. He said after the game that he forgot about the uh, timeout situation, which when do you ever hear that from Tom Brady? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and, yeah, and, and then the Patriots just let the uh, – you know, they missed an extra point. Goskowski missed a 42-yard field goal. They just let the Dolphins hang around, and then uh, the Dolphins struck on the final play. So just a terrible game for the Patriots. They've been bad on the road all season, uh, three and four on the road, and frankly, they were lucky to win that Chicago game against Mitchell Trubisky. So uh, it's going to be tough sledding again for the Patriots this Sunday in Pittsburgh. Yeah, we have no sympathy for missed field goals around here right now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Uh, listen, you, I mean, like, like I said, I mean, you've covered this Patriots team for, for numerous years years now uh this is not the juggernaut pay patriots teams we've seen in the past however comma as i like to say i mean still a, a potent offense and all where does this 2018 kind of patriots team i know it's tough for, to, to put you in the ranking you know uh mode here you know, but where would you kind of rank this 2018 patriots team and are they really super bowl caliber caliber they're Super Bowl caliber if they can somehow um, play only home games in the playoffs. Um, their schedule this year is its really strange. Um, they've beaten at home Andrew Luck, Aaron Rodgers, Pat Mahomes, um, Deshaun Watson, Kirk Cousins. They've uh, beat all these great quarterbacks, but all at home. And then on the road, they've lost to Blake Bortles, Matt Stafford, Marcus Mariota, and now Ryan Tannehill. So they're clearly a much better team at home than they are on the road. Um, I rank them uh, certainly towards the bottom uh, of the Bill Belichick, Tom Brady era, taking out the 2000 season and taking out 2008 when Brady was injured. But uh, obviously it's a very high bar. They've been to eight Super Bowls, so it, it's still a, a good season. But it's it's almost like 2009 when they went 10-6 and six and they were only 2-6 and six on the road. Just a, a bad sign all season long that they couldn't develop the mental toughness to win on the road. And, and I see a lot of parallels this season. Uh, they're just not a, a very good team on the road right now. Uh, and that was the last time, 2009, that the Patriots played in wild card weekend. Um, so, it, it, you know, the Patriots are, are hoping for that first round bye. They need it because if they have to play that wild card weekend, then I definitely don't think they're a Super Bowl caliber team. But, you know, if the Chiefs can get upset somehow in the playoffs, and that, that's been known to happen, and the Patriots can uh, play home games and then maybe host the AFC Championship, get that number two seed, I, I think – Sure, they could sneak in, but this is not one of their better teams by any stretch. Even the, it's kind of like the 2010 team that finished 14 and two, but then got smoked at home by the Jets uh, in the divisional round of the playoffs. And this this team feels similar too. They might end up with a great 12 and four record, but they're not a, a great team by any stretch. And uh, you know, this is a big game against Pittsburgh now. Um, n- not as much about fending off Pittsburgh in the playoff race, so that's still a factor. But they got to they got to keep pace with Houston. The, the Texans finally lost last week, but. They're 9-4 and four like the Patriots as well, so the Patriots just have to keep winning just to keep pace with the Texans and make sure they get that number two seed. Ben, looking at this team under the microscope, you have Sonny Michel in the backfield you know, leading the team in, in carries and yards. What does he offer the Patriots as a runner that maybe this team hasn't had in the past, if anything? Because it feels like he's more of a defined you know, runner than what you guys have had in previous years. Yeah, I mean, he's taking that like LeGarrette Blunt role, uh, the, the first and second down running back. Um, he's been pretty good this year. He, he's shown some decent power. Um, we all knew he had the home run ability uh, when he averaged eight yards a carry last year at Georgia, but uh, he's he sh- run with surprising power. Now, that said, he's been not good as a short yardage goal line back, and, and I don't know if it's him running too upright and not getting that pad level low, but uh, you know they, they've been giving the ball to James Devlin, the fullback, a lot lately, and he scored, I think, three touchdowns in the last two weeks. 
That's because Sony Michelle and Rex Burkhead have not been getting it done on short yardage, and it's been a, a desperation move more than anything to go to James Devlin. Uh, last week against Miami, just continually running into a brick wall. Uh, the, the Patriots had 30 rushes for 77 yards, you know, well uh, well under three yards per carry, and they were trying to establish the run game all uh, all game long and just getting stifled and uh, putting the Patriots in some second and third uh, and long opportunities, and Brady actually did a pretty good job of converting them. Uh, so Michelle's been okay. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy, not controversy, debate, I, I, I guess you could say, uh, in New England about whether he was worth the 31st overall pick. Um, people seem to think you can find running backs almost anywhere. But, um, you know, he's been okay. And with, with him and Burkhead, they at least give you three three down running back options. Both of those guys can run between the tackles. They can catch the ball out of the backfield. James White's been great out of the backfield this well, this year as well, uh, mostly as a runner. Uh, was really carrying the offense through the first half of the season. They've dialed back his opportunities a little bit just to make sure that um, his body is fresh and healthy for the playoffs. So they have a, a decent three three running back stable back there, but uh, has not been uh, certainly as good running the ball as they had hoped. It's been a weird, and I guess it's probably the right word, a weird 2018 for Rob Gronkowski with the retirement, the trade stuff, and the offseason. This year, it's been health problems, not his best year. As a Steelers fan, I still expect him to go for 300 yards against Pittsburgh this weekend. So how would you evaluate Gronkowski's you know, year as a whole? I know he's coming off a better game against Miami, and will he be a Patriot in 2019? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, right now, for for next year, Gronk's under contract for 10 million salary and a 12 million dollar cap hit. I can't imagine the Patriots look at him as a, a 10 million dollar player. So I, I think there's going to be something there in terms of a pay cut, mm-hmm. or maybe they just release him outright. I wouldn't be shocked if they said, "Hey, look, we'll give you five million dollars and we'll give you some incentives." And Gronk looks at it and says, "Well, there probably aren't too many other jobs out there where I can make." five to seven million dollars so you know we'll see about his future but clearly there's going to be an issue there this offseason and you know clearly Gronk hasn't been the same dominant player this year I I think the injuries and nine nine NFL seasons are starting to catch up with him Uh, he looks stiff he's not getting great separation Um, boy does he look slow at times and and no no better example of that than the final play which was not his fault he had no business being out there Uh, there was no chance of a Hail Mary and people are blaming Gronk for taking the wrong angle and looking so like that is not that is squarely 100 percent on the coaches, not on Rob Gronkowski, who's just trying to do the best that he can. But mm-hmm. you know he's still great in traffic. Um, he caught I think all eight passes for over 100 yards and a touchdown last week, and it's all like contested catches. He's not getting super wide open. He, him fighting for the yards, he's not he's not as strong. You can tell he you know he's he's just not as physically strong and dominant as he used to be. Um, but he's still a, a net positive. He's still good in the run game, a, a good blocker. He, he still catches the ball. Him and Brady are on the same page. He's still a, a decent red zone target. Um, so he's not the same player and, and not an all pro and, and not a pro bowler, but you know, Gronk is still a net positive when he's out there for the Patriots and he still commands attention, maybe not constant double teams, but teams are always keeping an eye on Rob Gronkowski. So, you know, he's not the same player and, I don't know if he's going to have a dominant game against Pittsburgh like he always does, but um, you know he still helps out the offense, no question. When when they signed uh, Cordell or Patterson, you know during the off season, I kind of giggled. I thought, man, there's no way this guy. Uh, I mean, the, let's face it, the guy coming out of college had a football IQ that you know you better give him a coloring book for a uh, uh, for for a playbook there. But I mean, to to the credit of the Patriots. Man, they they really have utilized everything that this kid does well uh, offensively. You know, they had him in the backfield for for a little while there, uh, almost in kind of like a Ty Montgomery role, if you will. Uh, he obviously had a, a man. You won't find probably a, a better throw and catch. Uh, from Brady this past week against the uh, against the against the uh, Dolphins, there. Are you surprised? I mean, are you impressed with how Patterson's come in and done, uh, been able to accomplish what he's been able to accomplish? I mean, look, even though he only has 17 catches for I think 224 yards, three of those are touchdowns, and you know he's got 162 yards on the ground and another touchdown at that. Yeah, that that touchdown catch against the Dolphins, the uh, 37 yarder down the seam, that was a laser from Brady and that a great sure fingertip was. catch. Uh, from Patterson, uh, unbelievable pitch and catch there, and, and that was something new. We we haven't really seen Patterson go deep that that much this year. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been impressed with his skill set. He's probably the best natural athlete uh, on the Patriots, and uh, you know I credit the Patriots for finding specific roles for him, but not asking him to do too much. Um, 
you know, the catch numbers and the rushing numbers you cited, you know, it's not like he's getting 10 to 15 touches a game. He's returning kickoffs. He, he hit one for a touchdown against the Bears, um, so it paid off right there. They're giving him jet sweeps and bubble screens and the occasional deep balls we saw the other day. He's playing 10 snaps, 12 snaps a game. You know, the the jet sweep action, even if uh, it's just a fake, you know, it really does stress the defense and you have to pay attention to it. Um, but they're not asking him to run the full route tree. They're not throwing him 10 targets a game. He's not running comebacks and whip routes. And, he, you know, he's not Julian Edelman or Josh Gordon. It's just a very specific, almost gadget type of role. Uh, but they've done it very well. And uh, he, he's someone you always have to account for. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, they used him out of the backfield. The, the Raiders actually did that a little bit last year, too. But the Patriots, they had some uh, injury issues. Burkhead, Michelle, and um, – uh, Burkhead and Michelle were both out, and they didn't really have uh, a credible between the tackles running game. And they used Patterson back there, and against the Packers, I think he ran ten times and picked up sixty or seventy yards. Did a pretty good job. Uh, it's not what you usually want to do. You usually don't want a six foot four running back, but you know he's a great athlete and, and certainly fast and strong with the ball. So they've done a nice job of of using exactly what he's good at and not putting too much on his plate and and not asking him to be a uh, you know, full-blown wide receiver, really more of like a toy, like a hybrid for them, and uh, he's been a nice weapon for them. When you flip over to the defensive side of the ball, let you know, a few familiar faces over there. Obviously, Hightower and and Alondra Roberts and Gilmore and the McCourty uh, 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 twins back there as well too. Uh, Chung's been around for. I mean, it's, it's amazing how long. It seems like Chung's been there for for 14 years now, really. But uh, when you look at this defense and you look at the way teams have been able to, uh, or opposing offenses have been able to. You know, at times move the football very well against his defense. Is this, you know, I, I, is it more on the front end? I mean, is this a team? You look, they don't have a great number of, of uh, 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 sacks. I don't think overall there. Is this a team that just struggles to get consistent pressure? Uh, because you know, obviously in the back end they're not getting the turnovers either. And the Steelers, you know, definitely have the same problem with their defensive backs. But where are the primary holes on this defense? Uh, probably up front. It's a very similar defense to last year, and especially what you guys saw in the Super Bowl against the Eagles, where they really couldn't lay a finger on Nick Foles, and he had a lot of time to kind of pick the secondary part. Um, the Patriots secondary, I think, is very good. A lot of veterans. Stephon Gilmore, overall, uh, has been having a great season. Jason McCourty has been a, a terrific pickup from Cleveland. He's uh, mostly emerged as the number two corner and, and has done a really nice job. Had a great game two weeks ago against the Vikings and uh, Thielen and Diggs. Uh, and then Chung and, and Devin McCourty back there, as you mentioned. Deron Harmon's been around for a long time. Uh, they've got some scrappy uh, number three corners like Jonathan Jones and J.C. Jackson. Um, so they, they've got a good secondary, but they don't have a ton of speed up front. And you're right, they're, they're one of the worst uh, teams in the league in terms of sacks. They have gotten a lot of pressure. You know, pressure doesn't always lead to sacks, and sometimes the quarterback still completes the pass. But uh, they've d- done a decent job of uh, generating some pressure that have led to interceptions. The turnover numbers are actually pretty good this year. Um, I don't know how, how many they have off the top of my head, but it's more than last year. Last year they only um, forced 13 turnovers, and they had that by the bye week this year. Uh, they didn't have any last week against Miami, but two against the Vikings, one against the Jets before that. They have turned the ball over decently well. They have gotten some pressure, but they don't have a ton of speed up front. Their, their one big addition in the offseason was uh, Adrian Claiborne, uh, and he's been, I think, a boss, um, really only playing 15 snaps a game as a few sacks on the season. Trey Flowers is, is really their only consistent pass pass rusher. Kyle Van Noy and Hightower are pretty good blitzing, and the Patriots have done this uh, the last few weeks where they play this amoeba defense. Uh, they, they they show the cover zero look where they bring everyone up to the line of scrimmage and do a lot of bailing and blitzing and disguising of their uh, of their rush after the snap or right before the snap. Um, so we'll see how much they use of that uh, against Roethlisberger uh, on Sunday and, and can then kind of diagnose what they're trying to do. Um, but that that's the only way they can really generate pass rush because other than really Trey Flowers, they don't really have guys who can beat the offensive linemen one-on-one. I was going to ask you about Trey Flowers because he is the leading, uh, the, the sack leader on the Patriots, probably going to set a career high in sacks this year. How far has he come from year one to year three? I see him on tape. They move him all around. They do a ton of different stuff with him, interior, on the edge. Um, I know you mentioned you know Devin McCourty earlier, but would you consider Flowers to be the second best guy on this defense? 
it, it's it's between McCourty and Trey Flowers and Stephon Gilmore. Frankly, I, I think he's been mm-hmm. excellent, not only in coverage but uh, sticking his nose in the run game and being a, a sure tackler. Uh, I, I really like overall what, what Stephon Gilmore has done this year. Uh, yeah, Trey Flowers does lead the team with six and a half sacks. Um, he plays the most out of the front seven, uh, or excuse me, on the defensive line. They, they mostly do a rotation, but he'll play outside against the run, and then they've been putting him over the nose, um, sometimes on, on third down when they do the amoeba defense. and uh, Long arms, you know, not a pure pass rusher in the Von Miller type sense, but uh, can still get after the quarterback and is stout against the run. So a good three down player. Um, interested to see how he's going to do in free agency this year. Um, you know, it doesn't have the big sack numbers that teams like to see, but he's, I, I think, overall a very good uh, edge player and might price himself out of the Patriots uh, market based on the salary cap going up and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they've got Trey Flowers. Dietrich Wise has four and a half sacks. Uh, Adam Butler, a defensive tackle, has actually been, I think, very solid this year. Uh, two sacks this year, but has been very disruptive in the middle. Uh, and another defensive tackle, Lawrence Guy, uh, doesn't have a sack this year, but has been great against the run and is one of their more uh, consistent defenders as well. So they've got some good beef up front. Uh, Danny Shelton, who they acquired from the Browns, he's actually been inactive for the last two weeks. Um, and the run defense actually hasn't been very good, so I wonder if maybe they put him back in there against the Steelers. But, um, you know, a lot of times the Patriots are willing to concede the run because it takes the ball out of the quarterback's hand. And I think you might see that a lot this week, uh, especially with the Steelers having some injuries at running back. You, you might see the Patriots defense, you know, maybe daring and, and maybe even begging the Steelers to uh, run the ball and, and mm-hmm. to see this Patriots defense kind of playing back uh, a little bit. Uh, one, one quick question with Obi Mellon Fawnwood. You guys picked up uh, off of waivers from Oakland. Uh, I know Steeler fans wanted to Pittsburgh to take a look. Pittsburgh had interest in him coming out of UConn. I know he's played a little bit with your defense. Is he being used as a sub package guy or, or what's his role right now? Yeah, like a sub, sub package guy. He's getting. <laughs> okay. You know, five to ten snaps. It's hard to come in and learn a defense, especially kind of a complicated one like the Patriots. So they put him out there, you know, in some third down situations like, hey, just go cover the tight end one on one. And, you know, he looks good in terms of six foot four, can jump through the roof. Uh, has coverage skills, has tackling skills, and frankly, he should have been out. If not Devin McCourty, then then Obi should have been out there instead of Rob Gronkowski, right. uh, especially in that jumper hail mary role. That's that should be Obi's specialty. Um, so I think that was more of a long term play. Uh, he's only in the second year, former uh, second round picks, uh, and, and a guy who freaked out at the combine a few years ago. So clearly, teams thought highly enough of him, and and I think the Patriots, the reason they signed him was more for next year and. Uh, down the road, but he's contributing a little bit this year, and you'll see him on special teams as well. Uh, closing you out here with uh, you know Bill Belichick's known for being able to uh, take what opposing offense is the, one of the best things that the opposing offense does and take that away from him. And you kind of already answered this. You know, obviously they're going to pay a lot of attention to Antonio Brown. Uh, ben seems to think at some point opposing defenses will have to pay more respect to Juju Smith-Schuster. But, hey, there's only three, only three games left. Uh, we wish they, we, we wish opposing defenses would start uh, uh, giving uh, Antonio Brown a little less coverage here. Is that really what you expect? them do you expect a heavy brackets on on Antonio Brown per normal and like you said go ahead and dare the Steelers running game which hasn't been great since I don't know Baltimore game I guess uh to uh to to run against you yeah I mean that that certainly makes sense and and Belichick had an interesting quote yesterday about paying attention to Antonio Brown. He said, well, then that leaves Juju Smith-Schuster open, and I think the Patriots certainly respect the playmaking abilities of both of those guys. Um, and then if you leave them alone, then you get one-on-one with Jesse James and Vance McDonald, and it's it's definitely a pick-your-poison type of deal. Um, so, But I, I definitely expect them to dare the, the Steelers to run, like, please hand the ball off. We've seen that a lot, where Le'Veon Bell will get 30 touches against the Patriots and he'll rack up 160 yards, but overall the uh, Steelers' offense doesn't put up the points and kind of stalls out in the red zone. Uh, so I, I would expect something similar. The, the Patriots, between Deron Harmon and, and Devin McCourty, can certainly use both those guys to bracket uh, Smith-Schuster and Antonio Brown, and, and maybe you do take your chances one-on-one against those tight ends and, and the running backs, but this is going to be a challenge for the Patriots. They've not played well on the road this year at all. I, I don't like this matchup. And, and the quarterbacks they've lost to, Mariota, Bortles, Stafford, and Tannehill, those guys aren't uh, Ben Roethlisberger. So this is definitely a tough challenge for the Patriots. 
Uh, ben, all right, uh, it's, it's that time, uh, like we always try to do, you know, with, 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 with the opposing beat writers and all. I mean, look, uh, there's not a lot of confidence, you know, in Steeler Nation right now when it comes to this team, and there really shouldn't be. You know, the, the you know three consecutive losses, trying not to make it four, but this is really almost like a, a playoff game for the Steelers right now due to them shooting them themselves in the foot here in the last several weeks. Uh, obviously not a Patriots team. You know, as good as we've seen in the past. Got to come to Pittsburgh. What's going to happen? Uh, how do you see this from going? What's the final score? Yeah, maybe uh, I just haven't watched the Steelers enough, but I'm picking Pittsburgh in this one. I know the history says the Patriots always dominate, and maybe uh, this will come back to bite me in the bum uh, after the game, but I, I just don't like how the Patriots have been playing on the road this year. Uh, I think the Steelers are a pretty desperate team right now, and I think they've been thinking about this Patriots game for an entire year ever since the Jesse James call last year and Big Ben throwing the interception in the end zone. Um, so I'm going to go Steelers 31, Patriots 27. I, I, I just I don't like how the Patriots have been playing on the road this year, and uh, it's been a bad trend, and, and I don't see them being able to magically make it better for this Sunday. And, and you and look, I mean, you're you're one of the um, most objective uh, guys that cover the Patriots as well, too. So, and, and look, you're not afraid to pick for them either, with, and with good reason. So, uh, it's kind of interesting that you're going against. How many times have you gone against them this year? I think only in uh, in the Jacksonville game in week two. I, I thought that that looked like a scheduled loss from the beginning, especially when Julian Edelman wasn't in there and it was 107 degrees on the field and all that stuff. I thought they would beat Tennessee. I thought they would beat Detroit. So that, you know, it didn't look so good on those nights, but, and you're right. I usually do pick the Patriots to win, but I just don't, I, I don't like this matchup. I don't like how they're playing on the road. Uh, that was a devastating loss uh, against Miami last week. We'll see how they respond to it, but uh, I, I just, I, I don't know. I like, I like Pittsburgh in this one. Uh, all right, Ben, uh, look, I mean, if the Steelers do end up winning this, and hopefully you, uh, it'll put them, well, it will put them closer to the playoffs there. But if they lose it, man, there are going to be some nervous people uh, in, in Pittsburgh. And who knows, maybe you, uh, maybe we can have you on again in a few more weeks uh, once the playoffs get underway, uh, these two uh, meet again. And, uh, folks, you can follow Ben on Twitter, at Ben Volin, V-O-L-I-N. Make sure you reach out to him and let him know you heard him on a terrible podcast. Ben, certainly do appreciate it. And like I said, hopefully we can do this in a few more weeks. Thanks, Ben. Awesome. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Thank you again to Ben Volin for coming on the show. Always appreciate it. I know he's a busy guy. Again, one more last time. You can follow him at Ben Volin, V-O-L-I-N on Twitter. Uh, and as always, I know D- Dave says it, but I'll say it as well. Um, please, you know, shout him out on Twitter if you do follow uh, him on Twitter or follow us on Twitter. Uh, let him know that you appreciate him coming on and giving his insight. Uh, again, these guys are really busy. The life of a beat writer is is certainly a hectic one. Uh, so let him know that you appreciate uh, him taking some time to talk to us. And, and as always, it was just great insight from Ben. Yeah, and uh, make sure you reach out to not only him, but uh, uh, Dr. Mel as well, too, at Girl yeah. Surgeon. Uh, I'm sure she'd be tickled pink to, to hear uh, uh, hear from some folks as well, too. Uh, speaking of which, you know, we, we talked to, to Dr. Mel earlier in the show. Now that you've digested everything, and we kind of talked a little bit about this in, in the interview, but, you know, I wanted to kind of wrap a bow around this thing. You know, and look, some of these beat writers – like it or not, they're they're very good, but some of them <clears throat> defend defend the organization just too much, and, and and I think you're starting to see a little bit of that, you know, more than 24 hours removed from uh you know from 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 you know what Mike Tomlin had to say about Ben immediately after the game, after reading. Reading and hearing what Mike Tomlin had to say Tuesday, and and reading and hearing what Ben Ben Roethlisberger said Tuesday during his radio show, <clears throat> I still think, and I listened to what Mel told us a couple of times. I still think the most damning thing that 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 Tomlin said on Tuesday was saying, "Look, you know, we knew we had Ben, and we were willing to use him if we thought we needed to win the game. If he was healthy enough to come back in that game when he did." then why the hell wasn't he in that game, you know, right after he came out of the locker room? Mm -hmm. You know, I I get the whole, it took a long time for the x-rays. I get the whole, uh, I I get the whole, you know, not able to read the x-rays. We're not really sure what's going on with Ben. I, 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 I get all that, but I also get too that a doctor can probably, 
you know, as Mel told us, you know, clinical diagnosis or however you want to call it. Look, if you're not going to play him, don't play him. And, you know, if it's something, this isn't the same as a shoulder injury, right? I mean, a, uh, a rib injury can be a lot, lot more life threatening, mm-hmm. you know, than, 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 than a shoulder injury can be. So why not just rule him out of the game and then not put him back in? The fact that you didn't rule him out. To, to me, all this just stinks of, of Tomlin saying, we think Dobbs can get it done. We think the defense can get it done. We're only going to break glass in case of an emergency here. Oh, crap. Put him in. Yeah, that, that, that's really where I've, I've fallen. And I, and I understand the complexity. And now that we have more clarity on the whole situation and difficulty of knowing what the injury was, I get all that. I do. It's a tough situation to be in. But... If you're Tomlin, you've already made the decision that you're playing Ben again because he said it regardless of whether the Raiders had scored on that uh, their last drive or not. You know Ben was uh, was going to come into the game. They're, they're, so, sec- they're second, second to last. Yeah, I'm sorry, second to last drive. Uh, ben was going to come in the game, so it wasn't a matter of score or anything like that. So you've already made the decision that you're going to assume that risk and play Ben. So why not do that earlier? Because either way, you're assuming risk. Either way, one drive, two drive, whatever. You know, you're assuming risk. He could get hurt. You know, whatever the case is. Um, now, had you know, Tomlin said we're just not going to play Ben at all. We're not going. We're going to err on the side of caution, regardless of score. I can respect that decision. It's disagreeable, fine, but you can respect that decision. You don't want to risk a uh, injury, and that's the stance you want to take. But if you're already planning on playing him, you might as well play. You know, if you're going to walk on ice, you might as well dance. So that's the part that bothers me the most. I, I yo, look, I if if. If if it was to come out that Ben said, "Look, I'm not. You know, give me a give me another series or two so I can kind of get this thing, you know, moving a little bit better and all, and you know, uh, let this shot or whatever, you know, take effect." But you know, Mel already kind of told us that by the time he come out of that locker room, <clears throat> you know, he he was probably not 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 much pain at that point there. So. Uh, just some of the things he said were were kind of damning yesterday with with Tom and talking about the, you know, uh, treating it like a, like the Bengals game and and then well you know if we thought we need we'd put him in if we thought you know he we needed him to win the game and then the other aspect of of uh, he was going to go in. You know, that second, you know, after that second last series, regardless, all, all of that when thrown together and analyzed does not look great on his part there. If you want to tell me the, the cool story about the x-ray machine and, and how you're walking like spinal tap through underneath the stage to try to find the uh, uh, the x-ray machine, yeah, go ahead and tell me that. You want to tell me that the pictures didn't offer, uh, the x-rays didn't offer much clarity? Okay, yeah, go, cool story. Go ahead and tell me that. You know, I'll, I'll throw that in there if you want to tell me that the doctor said, uh, well, you know, in, in Ben's case, it you know, could be one of three things. We're not really sure what's going on. Okay, I get that. But some of the other the other things that he said in there kind of, to me, detracted from that. And and to me, I, I just think he made a poor decision there, thinking that he could trust Dobbs and trust the defense when he really mm-hmm. should have put his starting quarterback back in the game. Yep, right there with you. I think he mishandled it. Um, I think he mishandled both the in-game decision and the response afterwards, and that's only kind of added to this problem. Now, I'll get the pitchforks out for as we close out the show. I don't think Tomlin should be fired. I don't know where you stand on this. Uh, I know most fans, or a lot of fans, I should say, feel differently. But as we see here today, I don't believe that Tomlin deserves to be fired. No, you know, look, I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is a fan base and most fan bases in general from if you, if you do a search uh, you know, on Twitter, you can find a fire him, fire that, fire you know, fire everybody type type of thing there. So, uh, no, I mean, look, it, what, is this debacle rate rate right up there in one of his worst ones? Absolutely, yes. absolutely, it does. Is it going to be super disappointing if this team misses the playoffs now at this point? Yes. Uh, you know, look, we'll see what they got against New England, and we'll break that down a little bit more on, on Friday and get more in-depth. Of course, you and the guys will have the post up, the scouting reports up uh, on it as well, too. But, you know, there's not going to be any surprises, I don't think, that we've seen over the last couple of years when it comes to the Patriots. No, look, this could turn around, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not expecting it. But like we said the other day, <laughs> it would be such a Mike Tomlin Steelers thing to do for them to turn around and beat the Patriots uh, this week. And we, we, we could, 
and I use that word lightly, we could go from one of the worst losses in, in Tomlin's career to maybe one of the best wins in, in Tomlin's career. So, it, you know, we'll see how the team and him are able to handle it this week. And, and obviously, once again, as Ben told us, this isn't the juggernaut Patriots teams that that, uh, that we've seen in, in, in the past there. So uh, we got a great uh, email from Mark Schreer, I think, that we'll try to read on Friday as well, too. We failed to get to in this one, but uh, I think in the meantime, we should better end this action pack uh, show. Once again, thanks to Ben Volan. Thanks to uh, Dr. Melanie Friedlander for coming on the show. You can follow me on Twitter at Steelers Depot. You can follow Alex Kazora at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Send us your emails, theterriblepodcast at gmail.com. We'll try to get back in the mode of reading some of these things uh, on, on the podcast as well, too. And uh, that's all we got until Friday, as always. Thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.